Good morning. So today we have Tom Martinelli, who, according to his bio in there, was born and raised in Madison. He's written two family history books and a book on the history of Madison Edgewood football program and involved in the publishing of four neighborhood history books for the Westmoreland neighborhood in Madison, where he's lived for 40 years, which is also Midvale's neighborhood. So we thought it'd be good to come in and learn about our neighborhood with his history. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so, so I just briefly on myself, I, I moved to uh, Westmoreland in 1956 and I was going into second grade uh, at Queen of Peace School. Um, I left West, I grew up in Westmoreland then in the 50s and 60s I left uh, after I had graduated from the UW, uh, moved out of town for a few years, but then came back to Madison and, and bought our first house in Westmoreland in 1976. Um, and now we're in our second house uh, in Westmoreland, just down the street here on Caramar. So I guess I guess you could say I'm kind of stuck stuck to Westmoreland. So um, we started a Westmoreland History Committee in 2001. Um, in 2002, we started publishing uh, history articles in our neighborhood newsletter, the Westmoreland Courier. And uh, since then, we made a commitment to have a history article every issue of the Courier, and we've been able to meet that commitment. Um, to the point where we've written over 100 articles now. So um, my, a lot of my talk today is going to be based on those articles and the history books that we did uh, from the article. So if we could have the next slide. Uh, so this is Westmoreland. Uh, if you're not familiar with the area, um, it uh, uh, has about uh, 890 single-family houses, um, another 43 condos across the street here at uh, Sequoia Commons, and there's also 100 apartments in the Sequoia Commons, another 60 apartments next door at Midvale Heights. Um, so if you add that all up, there's about 1,090 housing units in Westmoreland, and about roughly 2,600 people live here. So um, it's, a, it's a nice little community. Okay. So I'm going to start out, like every story about Wisconsin, talking about glaciers and uh, Native Americans. Now, I'm not an expert on either topic, so we're going to probably move through this uh, a little quickly, but uh, we need to talk about this to lay the groundwork. So uh, the Wisconsin Glacier extended through um, uh, Madison area, actually about half of Dane County um, thousands, thousands of years ago. And when it receded, it, it scraped the land just like heavy equipment does on road projects, and it rearranged the soils and it left Westmoreland with some very um, uh, productive soil as far as, uh, you know, for, which would eventually become farmland. It also left us with a ridge. Um, if you think about the streets in the area, and it's about any direction you go from here, you're going downhill. So it left a ridge right through Westmoreland uh, that extended up to uh, Hoyt Park is the high point on the ridge. And so about 85% of Westmoreland area drains to the south into Lake Wingra. And that, again, uh, with that southern exposure, made it a very appealing area for uh, once it became inhabited. So uh, next, um, the uh, Native Americans uh, were in this area for uh, a few, couple thousand years. This is a, a famous sketch that was made showing the location of the of the uh, Indian camps and, and villages in the area. There's a huge concentration down around Lake Wingra. There's also um, this spot right here is that pond in uh, Odana Golf Course. So there's also camps out there. Um, and when they, uh, they migrated to this, uh, Native Americans, my, uh, originally the uh, Winnebago, which became the Ho-Chunk, migrated to this area from Kentucky in about uh, 500 AD. They were uh, living in this area. And then in, uh, next slide. Um, so this is not Westmoreland, but I'd like to show this picture. It's actually the Dudgeon Monroe neighborhood, 
that's Monroe Street running down there and Lake Winger in the distance. But uh, every year, the uh, developers of, of this area would hire a professional photographer to stand up on what was the railroad grade and take a photograph to show how the area was being developed. So the Native Americans could, could stand up in what's now uh, Forest Hill Cemetery and they would have a, a clear view down to the lake, where, which was where their camps were. Um, they, they, um, you know, they fished in, in Lake Winger, they grew wild rice up in this area, they grew crops, corn and such, and uh, hunted. There was quite a variety of wildlife in this area. Uh, deer, uh, moose, elk. If you, if, you, um, the, if you go down Midvale Boulevard here, down to the bike trail, there's a, a, little, a very small green space with a couple statues of buffalo down there. And that's to recognize the fact that there were buffalo in this area at one time. Um, it was a lot of uh, pr open prairie, uh, what we call oak savanna, and you still can find the remnants of prairies and oak savannas out in uh, the Arboretum, which would, will, tell, will show you what this area looked like at one time. Okay. And then um, in 1832, the whole chunk were forced out of this area. Um, they ceded their land to the federal government um, in a number of treaties that were written. So um, they, they were forced west from here. Uh, next slide. However, there was some that, that came back to this area, uh, scattered uh, uh, campsites. This is actually out in the Arboretum in the late 1800s, uh, showing a Ho-Chunk uh, hut. Um, and they, they, they lived around Lake Wingers because they knew they could, there were springs there, they knew they could fish. And, uh, and, they, and they still, there's still some here in the early 1900s. Next. So then the next big step was uh, the federal government had all this land. They um, surveyed it in, in December of 1834. The federal surveyors were in this area. And uh, interesting enough, the, the UW library in their digital collection has a digital copy of the surveyor's notes from uh, when they were here in this area. In, ad in addition to setting uh, section corners, they also made notes on what the land looked like. So there's reference to uh, trails. Um, there was a trail from uh, Westmoreland Boulevard area that went up towards Hoyt Park and then down to University Avenue and around Lake Mendota uh, to the Middleton area. And then they also made note of the type of land. It was hilly, rolling with uh, prairie grasses. And like I mentioned before, it's similar to the Curtis Prairie out in the Arboretum. Um, and then the next year, 1835, the government put the land up for sale. And anybody could buy a parcel of uh, land. It was a minimum of 40 acres you had to purchase. And it was $1.25 an acre. So <laughs> $60 for 40 acres. Um, the, the area was appealing to land speculators. These were people who didn't buy the land to live on it. They bought it as an investment. And they thought by buying and selling land, they were going to make money. Um, so um, the reason this area was appealing, there was what was called the military road, which ex basically extended out Mineral Point Road to Cross Plains, and then it cut down uh, to, to uh, Mount Horb, and then out to Dodgeville. And then the military road kept going straight to Prairie du Chien, which where there was a, a federal camp, uh, fort. And then there was another stretch of it that went down to the uh, uh, from Dodgeville went down to uh, Belmont, which is where the temporary state capital was, and Mineral Point because of the mining down in that area. So um, it was it was a kind of like a gateway to the west uh, from Madison. Um, then there, the then there was a lower route that went out Monroe Street, Nakoma Road, and that was appealing because of the springs. Um, there's a what we've called the we call the duck pond there on Nakoma Road. There's, which is fed by a number of springs, and so they could stop there and get water. And there was also two uh, um, uh, stagecoach stops. Uh, one was the what's now the Arbor House Bed and Breakfast, um, built in the 1850s, and the second one was uh, this what was called the Spring Tavern, which is that uh, private house now on Nakoma Road, across from the Duck Pond. Next. Uh, so I want to highlight uh, uh, Allison Sweet. He was one of the first, he was the first property owner 
uh, as a land speculator in Westmoreland. He owned uh, 80 acres that stretched from um, Mineral Point Road down to Tokay Boulevard and from Glenway Street over to uh, Westmoreland Boulevard. So he had 80 acres there. Never, never lived on the land, just bought it to eventually sell to somebody, which he did. But he has, he has an interesting resume uh, that I like to talk about. He uh, grew up in northern uh, state of New York in the, th in the Three Lakes, Finger Lakes area, and came to uh, Illinois. Or he, first of all, he was at 14 years old, he was a, a riverboat pilot on the Erie Canal. Then he came, moved to Illinois and to what was called, at the time was called Naper Village, is now the city of Naperville, which is a major suburb uh, west of Chicago. Um, he lived there for a while and farmed, and then he, a group of 12 people, including Mr. Sweet, uh, signed the incorporation papers that created the town of Chicago. So he, bought, he built the first uh, two-story wooden house in Chicago, uh, near the Chicago River, and then he got, after he was married, he built a, a, the first brick house in Chicago, which still exists. And eventually he moves to Milwaukee. He gets himself elected to the territorial uh, uh, um, the legislative group that's meeting in Belmont to decide where the capital is going to be. Becomes a friend of, Jim, of James Doty, helps him lay out the original uh, plat map for down with the Isthmus area in Madison. And... Um, ends up buying hundreds of acres in this area, not only in Westmoreland, but all around the west side. And uh, he, he eventually sells that land. And uh, the other thing about when he lived in Milwaukee, he was also a, a contractor and he built, uh, he built shipping boats that uh, were on Lake uh, Michigan. He, built, he had a contract to build 11 lighthouses with the federal government on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. He built the uh, grain elevators um, along the um, Milwaukee River where they loaded uh, grain onto the boats and traveled the, uh, the Great Lakes. So he, he's a pretty interesting story. Oh, and that, by the way, that's an oil painting that's in the uh, collection at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Okay. So after land speculation went on for a few years, then the farmers moved in. So people bought the land to farm. Uh, in the in the 1850s. So these are some of the major players, the first uh, farmers in this area. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, a couple of them. Uh, Piper, the Piper family, uh, Piper Drive is named after that family. Uh, they had a, a, a farmhouse on uh, Odana Road across from the golf course, which is still there. Um, it's been added on to a number of times. And then there was the, uh, the uh, Tillerson family had a farm down here on uh, Tokay, uh, on uh, Odana Road, right next to the uh, bike trail. And that farmhouse is still there, although it's, it was originally a log cabin and it's been added on to over the years. Um, uh, let's see, uh, oh, the other, uh, the, so Dor uh, that was Tillerson. So Dorfer um, owned land, which is uh, where Queen of Peace Church is now. Um, and which eventually got you know redeveloped for housing, but and then the the last one is the Tepfer family. Um, Miss, Mr. Tepfer Sr. Uh, came here from uh, England and um, farmed north of Middleton, and then he bought farmland, 473 acres of farmland uh, out here off of Mineral Point Road. It stretched from uh, Mineral Point over to Tokay Boulevard and from uh, uh, Gammon Road down to Whitney Way. Um, okay, next. So uh, this is back to, uh, oh, this is the, the Baker Farm, uh, uh, far, uh, barn that uh, housed uh, a, uh, animals and their carriages and their horses. And then the second floor they, uh, where they stored their uh, uh, wheat. Um, this was uh, built, this is the oldest house in Westmoreland or the oldest building in Westmoreland. They figured it was built sometime during the Civil War. Um, next. And that's now been converted to a house. It's been added on to on the right-hand side there in the 30s and was converted to a house. This is on, it's on Pawnee Avenue. Next. So then, ba then back to Mr. Tepfer. Uh, he bought the um, um, 
So uh, Mr. Tepfer Sr. Uh, built this brick farmhouse in 1872, and his son was born there the same year, uh, Otto Tepfer Jr. Uh, that farmhouse is now Otto's Restaurant. That's why it's called Otto's, because it's in, in honor of the, uh, uh, Mr. Tepfer Sr. So um, if you go there, there's pictures showing the, the farm operation. There's a family picture that's hanging in the, one of the walls in the bar. So um, you can see those. And then uh, Otto Tepfer Jr. Um, was born in 1872. And then I, I refer to him as the grandfather of Westmoreland. He's the first developer of Westmoreland. He bought the property from the Baker, the Baker Sunnyside Farm, which is over by Glenway Golf Course, and farmed it for a while. Next. Okay, this is the Tepfer farmhouse out of, which was now Otto's. And then this is Otto Tepfer Jr.'s house in Westmoreland on, uh, on, on appropriately Tepfer Avenue. Um, it's the biggest, <laughs> biggest house in Westmoreland. It's about 3,700 square feet. There's uh, seven bedrooms, five bathrooms. And I've been told that one, uh, there was a bowling alley in the basement. I've never seen it, but uh, they apparently like to bowl. So we farmed it for a few years and then decided that there, there was money to be made by uh, subdividing in the lots to sell. So this is the first plat map of, of Westmoreland um, from Glenway over to uh, Tepfer Avenue. Um, the, the first houses in Glenway were built down towards uh, the, the railroad, uh, the Illinois Central Railroad grade. Okay. And then the next, the next uh, name in Westmoreland development is, is uh, A.O. Tonic. Tonic was a banker. Um, he, he was one, he's one of the starter of the Commercial State Bank, which was that building at the top of State Street, which where uh, Ian's Pizza is now. Um, <laughs> he bought some land from Tepfer along Westmoreland Boulevard and, and sold the lots. Uh, he was, I am assuming he was one of uh, Tep, Tepfer's uh, bankers. And that's how he got, got interested in, in Westmoreland. Um, next. So the, fir the, first, uh, the first plat map that references Westmoreland was filed by uh, Pawnick in uh, 1926. Um, he, he was the one that's credited with naming the area Westmoreland. This is the next developer is John McKenna. He's, uh, he's well known for developing the Shoreward, Shoreward uh, neighborhood, Shoreward Hills. He did a number of other neighborhoods in uh, both the west side of Madison and the east side in, uh, in Monona. Um, he formed a, what was called the Westmoreland Company to develop uh, lots and, and sell them off. Next. And this is one of their ads for the Westmoreland Company. Now, if you look at that sketch, it looks like Westmoreland goes on forever. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really only six blocks from Minimal Point Road down to the golf or to the park. So uh, they, they kind of deceive you a little bit. And this, the other interesting thing that we'll talk about is this shows a golf course on either side of Westmoreland. So the city developed the Glenway Golf Course, and then uh, McKenna and a group developed what they called Westmoreland Golf Course, which is, um, I'll, we'll, I'll talk about some more. Um, but in the, and it mentions uh, Dudgeon School. It's in within walking distance of Dudgeon. It's within walking distance of the future high school, which was West High which was built in the late uh, 1920s. So um, that's an ad that they, that they uh, had in the newspaper. Next. And so Glenway Golf Course was the first city municipal golf course opened in 1927. Uh, these gentlemen are on the second tee um, with some Westmoreland houses in the background. Notice how, <laughs> how they're dressed. Uh, <laughs> they have top hats and, and ties and suits and it was a gentleman's game at the time, I guess. Uh, but golf became very popular in the 20s. It was relatively cheap to golf. Uh, people had more free time because of all the uh, improvements that were being made for their lifestyle. And so they, they had time. The guys had time to golf. The, the wives are still back, you know, taking care of the house and, and the kids. But uh, it's, so next. So this is just a a scorecard for Westmoreland Golf Course, or I'm sorry, Glenway Golf Course, uh, back going back to the 1920s. It's a relatively easy golf course to play, uh, nine holes. Um, 
And then also in the late 1920s, McKenna built these stone, we call them stone gates at the Westmoreland Boulevard. So um, this is the oldest picture I've been able to find of Westmoreland uh, from the uh, McVicker collection at the Historical Society. Uh, notice there's one house in the background. Uh, the area off to the right where that underneath that big tree, that would be Westmoreland Golf Course. So they, they did this to attract attention to the area. This was gonna be the grand entrance to the to the golf course. Uh, they never did build a clubhouse. Um, they just had a small shed that was left over from the farming operation where you could, where you paid your money and you know, there were some refreshments there. Okay, and this is what it looks like now. So quite a change over 90 plus years. Those stone gates are still in very good condition. We spent some time keeping them maintained um, and uh, they're an attraction to the neighborhood. Okay. So this is the oldest aerial view I found, 1937. Um, the area up in the right-hand corner, which is across from the golf course, uh, I, ca I call that Old Westmoreland. That's where the house, first houses were developed. Um, the area to the um, west is still open. The area down between Tokay Boulevard and Odana is still farmland. Next. And then uh, this is the, what we think the layout was of the golf course that they developed. This is the uh, Dorfer farm, which we mentioned earlier, and they converted it to a golf course. Um, it, it didn't last very long, about 15 years. And you know, if you think about the, the timing there, it was during the Great Depression and then the start of World War II. Okay. And this is an ad for the Westmoreland golf course. You could golf there for 25 cents. $12 for the season. Like I said, it was a pretty uh, cheap way to entertain yourself. <laughs> Next. And then this is interesting. Kitty Corner from Queen of Peace Church. Uh, th so this is uh, north of Mineral Point Road along uh, Owen. They developed a, a driving range. And it was, it was known as, they claimed it was the first lit driving range in the Midwest. So then this was uh, started in the, in the early 30s and it only lasted for a handful of years. It, and again, probably because of the depression, they just couldn't make a go of it. But um, it, it, it's hard to see in the dark, but there's, there's Model T uh, Fords parked behind the golfers and uh, okay. And then um, this is back to Westmoreland Golf Course. Um, I, I talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about Carson Gully. He, for anybody that knows the history of uh, the University of Wisconsin, he, um, he came to uh, the campus in 1920s as a cook in the dorm, uh, dormitory cafeterias, and he worked his way up to be the head chef for all of the food service in, at, at the university. And he's, he's well known for developing a recipe for uh, fudge bottom pie, which they still serve at the Union. Um, but he loved to golf, and for years I was looking for a photo, a, a ground level photo of people golfing at, at Westmoreland Golf Course, and I could never find one. A couple years ago, the uh, Historical Society puts out a, periodically puts out a, a magazine with history articles about Wisconsin, and, and here there's an article in there about Carson Gully with this photograph. So the, the houses in the background are along Holly Avenue and, and down Euclid, and um, they, they originally credited this photo to Glenway Golf Course. Well, I, I said, that's not, that's not Glenway. Uh, so I volunteer there at the Historical Society, so I, I have access to the database, so I went in and changed it to Westmoreland Golf Course. <laughs> but the, he just, this, uh, Mr. Gully just loved to golf, and unfortunately, because he was a black gentleman, he could not get a membership at one of the city country clubs. So that's why he spent a lot of time at Westmoreland and Glenway. So one day he's golfing at Glenway. He's on the eighth hole, which is a short par three hole, goes downhill. He gets a hole in one there. So he, uh, he and his wife had already purchased uh, cemetery plots at Forest Hill Cemetery. And they went back to the office and they exchanged their plots for, for two different plots, which were right across the service road from the eighth green. <laughs> So when his friends and family went to visit their grave sites, they could see where he got a hole in one. That's how much he liked to golf. <laughs> Next. Okay, so housing development in Westmoreland starts out kind of slow. 
in the 20s. Um, and then, of course, like I said, we get into the Great Depression. Not much was being built in Westmoreland. And then uh, the Depression ends, and there's this little period of time for a year or two uh, before World War II starts where there is a, there's a surge in uh, housing construction. And then it kind of drops off again during the war. And then in the late 40s, early 50s, my house was built in 51. And that year, there was 81 houses under construction in Westmoreland. That's the big peak there. So the, the, house, or the housing construction continues through the, the 50s. And, and by early 1960, it's pretty much, it's filled in. And so there hasn't been much built since then. Next. Uh, and I wanted to give you some examples of the, um, I, I think this is really interesting, the variety of residential architecture we have in the neighborhood. So this is a house on Pawnee. There's a, a house that looks almost identical to this on the back side of this on, on Midville, or Mineral Point Road. And these were built by the developers as kind of an off, as, you know, kind of a spec home and an office space. Um, the early developers of Westmoreland wanted to be another Nakoma. I have this theory. I've never talked to anybody from back <laughs> during that time, but um, they wanted to be another Nakoma. So they, de they developed a golf course. They built the stone walls, uh, very similar to Nakoma. And then they had restrictions on what kind of a house you could build. There was an architecture review board that you had to take your plans to and get approved. So they were, you know, they wanted to promote sim similar uh, residential housing architecture in Westmoreland. So, um, however, <laughs> when the depression hit and they were desperate just to sell lots, they, they kind of, they dropped the price in half. They, you know, ended up allowing any kind of architecture. So, uh, next that, oh, this is the, um, the twin house on, on Mineral Point Road. Okay. And I love this house. I think this is a classic, uh, stucco finish, uh, English Tudor. It's on uh, Pawnick, uh, built in the late 1920s by a banker by the name of ba Bacchus, who was a partner with uh, McKenna. And that's why I assume he was another banker for uh, Otto Tepfer. But uh, this house has always been very well maintained and it's got a classic street appeal. And a few years ago, next slide, I got in touch with the daughter of, the, of ba Bacchus's daughter that you know, grew up for a few years in this house, and she gave me this picture of what it looked like shortly after it was built. Okay, and then there was also an ad in the paper promoting the fact that the, a banker had built in Westmoreland. So, you know, if if he thinks it's a good neighborhood, then you should th you should build here too. So it's kind of a promotional thing. Next, um, I like this house. It's across the street from Queen of Peace School on Holly. This is a Sears catalog house. Um, you, you could buy a kit out of the catalog and all the parts would be delivered to your property and uh, you could assemble it there. So I, the, the S on, this, on the fireplace, on the chimney, I don't, I don't know if that stands for Sears or if it's for the, for the original family that built the house. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Next. And this is the most famous house in Westmoreland. This is the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Usonian home. Um, he designed this for... Uh, a newspaper man by the name of uh, Jacobs, Her, uh, Herb Jacobs and his wife on uh, Tepfer. Um, the, the neat thing about this house is it's, it is now on the UNESCO uh, heritage list, which is a uh, UN organization that promotes uh, the preservation of historic sites and, and culture. Um, and in, in 2019, uh, this house, along with seven other Frank Lloyd Wright designed buildings around the country, were put on that list. That list includes the, uh, Colise the Roman Colosseum, the uh, um, Eiffel Tower, the Grand Canyon, the Great Wall of China. I mean, there's, there's a couple thousand locations on that list. And here, our house in Westmoreland is now on that list. I think it's kind of cool. Okay, and then uh, this house is interesting. It's right across the street from the Frank Lloyd Wright house. It was designed by a, a local architectural firm, uh, Strang Architecture still exists out on Mineral Point Road. This is actually a, a, br a concrete block house. Now, the, um, the Brunzel brothers, there's still a Brunzel lumber yard out of, um, um, off the Beltline. Um, they were, they were, Brunzels were building you know, wood-framed, wood-stick houses, and 
they somehow got an interest in this style of house. It was called the international style, and it came over here from France in the 1930s. And so uh, they built this house for one brother, and then they built a house for the other brother over on Pawnee Avenue, which is a two-story concrete block house. Next. So the current owners of this house, uh, a few years ago, decided they needed more space, so they hired a, an architecture that was very sensitive to the, the original um, design, and added a second story, um, and added the, uh, the, the landscaping in the front so that uh, they could stay there uh, with their expanded family. Uh, this is a, a house right around the corner from the Frank Lloyd Wright design house on, uh, on uh, Euclid, and this was designed by William Kayser, who was, uh, he was not a, a student of um, Wright's, but he, he admired Wright's design and his philosophies, and so uh, he designed this house. It looks pretty simple from the front, but if you go to the backside, just like the Usonian house, you've got southern exposure, and it's all glass, and that's where the living room is and the fireplace, and it looks a, it looks a lot more spectacular from the back. But they, this was, you know, they wanted privacy on the front. And then uh, some major events in Westmoreland. Um, the Neighborhood Association, originally was called the Community Association, was developed in... Uh, organized in 1941. It's the fourth oldest uh, neighborhood association in Madison. Um, the first event they planned was the 4th of July uh, event at the park, which still goes on. Uh, they, they started a, a newspaper, neighborhood newspaper, uh, running it off on mignograph machines. We have a collection of all the issues of the, started out being called the dope. And that was a, that was a newspaper man's term for, I'm gonna give you all the information you need to know. Um, and so that was, that's a Herb Jacobs uh, uh, effect. Um, so his wife was the editor for a couple years, and then Jacobs sold her house in Westmoreland, moved. Uh, they had Frank Lloyd Wright design another house for him out um, in um, Middleton off of Old Sock, Old Sock Road and um, across from that uh, old historic church. Um, so um, it became, it, then the next editor came along and changed it to the Courier, which it still is. We, we have, still have Santa visits in the neighborhood. Westmoreland Park was tax delinquent land that McKenna uh, and the Westmoreland Company owned. Um, so the neighborhoods, neighbors got together, and at the time we were in the town of Madison, they approached the town board and said, you know, can you purchase that land for a community park? So uh, people in the neighborhood donated money. It was about $3,000 in back taxes that had to be paid. So between the town of Mid uh, Madison and the um, the neighborhood, they paid off the taxes and it became uh, our, our neighborhood park. Okay, uh, here, just a couple pictures of the early 4th of July celebrations next. They had games, adult and youth games, which they still do. Uh, there was a parade, which still goes on, probably the most popular part of the event. Uh, this is uh, coming down Westmoreland Boulevard towards the park. And then this is the, this is a copy of the first uh, issue of the dope, and it's it's uh, like I said, it was run off on a mignograph machine. <laughs> Next, and then this was when it be, in January '43 it became the Courier, and then uh, now ne next, um, this is a more current example of what the Courier looks like. It's 16 pages. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a number of uh, uh, of uh, sponsors to pay for advertising space, so. Um, there's a, a lot of inf neighborhood information in there, okay? And then West, uh, we talked about Westmoreland Park. It's a popular spot in the neighborhood. Um, and then going back to housing in the 40s, I, I, like the, I like the look of this house. It's at the corner of uh, St. Clair Street in Glenway. It's a uh, uh, stone um, structure, one story, obviously, and it's, it's just a classic-looking house. Okay. And then we also have simple Cape Cod houses. Um, story and a half. This is one that backs up to Westmoreland Park. Um, the stone in this house and a number of the other houses in Madison or in Westmoreland came from the stone quarries that used to be up at Hoyt Park. Okay. Okay. Then we have the the what's called the Lessonian homes, so or Lesterian homes. I mean, um, after World War II, um, there was uh, the veterans came back. They wanted to start families. They did. They weren't interested in living with their parents anymore. There was a big need for housing, so the government uh, put out a request or a request for proposals. 
uh, how, you know, um, we need to build houses quickly. So this, the, the Lustrin homes were built, actually um, built in a factory. Um, those are two foot square metal panels on the outside walls and also on the inside walls. It has metal studs in the walls. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have a lot of insulation in the walls. Um, but but um, there was seven of these houses built in Westmoreland by uh, um, um, John Findorf and son. They, when the company first started, they were a home builder. I, I forgot to mention, but they also built Tepfer's house over in 1906 over on, on uh, Tepfer Avenue. So um, this is uh, the list of the seven houses in Westmoreland. We have the biggest, we had the biggest concentration of Lustrin homes. Um, Excuse me, but were the Lustrin homes built on foundations? No, just, just a concrete just a slab. slab. Yeah, yeah, there was no basements. Thanks. Yeah, there was very little space inside for storage. Uh, one interesting story is in the kitchen, they, the company developed a multi-use unit that could be used for a dishwasher and a clothes washer. <laughs> Don't ask me how it worked, but that's because they were so confined for space. So um, the, I mentioned the one on Glenway, right behind it, there's one on St. Clair Street, and then on Gately Terrace over by Westmoreland Park, there's one, and then uh, 505 South Owen, I don't, I don't know if you know the radio pers personality, uh, John Sylvester, he goes by the name Sly, he owns that house, and he's very proud of the, uh, being a Lustrin home, and he's, he's decorated the inside with 1950s type furniture and, and decoration. Um, and then just down the street from his, there's another Lustrin home, but a few years ago, somebody, the owners added a room on the front for a, I understand it was like a hot tub room for uh, medical purposes, but then they recited it. So, you know, you don't know if that it's even a Lustrin home anymore. Um, and then uh, Critchell Terrace, just around the corner from where I live, that one was torn down a few years ago. Um, the, a guy bought it and took it down piece by piece and reloc he was going to relocate it to some property he had up in Adams County and use it as a hunting shack. And then uh, more recently on Chatham, just off of uh, Tokay, um, another one was dismantled and there was a landscaping company that came and took it apart and was going to use it as for a storage building. And then there's a, a new house has been developed on that property. So Unfortunately, we really only have like four of them left that you can really identify as Lustrin homes. Okay, so this is Westmoreland uh, in the late 40s. The golf course is gone. Um, they, uh, the land's been subdivided. Streets have been put in. Um, they're at the corner of uh, Mineral Point Road and Midvale Boulevard, uh, all the way down to Tokay. This area down here between Tokay and Odana is still wide open farm type land. Um, I never, I don't think they ever grew corn there. I think it was used more for grazing purposes. Okay. Uh, back to the housing in the 50s, uh, Marshall Erdman, names well known in Madison, uh, designed and built this house. It's over by um, Westmoreland Park. Next. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the uh, Madison Prairie to Homes was actually in Westmoreland. Um, in 1954, it was the fourth time they had a parade of homes, and it was it was pretty much all uh, ranch style homes. That was the big style at that time. So I think there were 17 of them built that year for the parade of homes uh, between Odana Road and uh, Rolla Lane, Anthony Lane, Somerset, those streets just down the street from here. Okay, so now here we go. Uh, in the early 1960s, it's Westmoreland is pretty well developed, including the area here between Odana and in the railroad track, well, from Tokay to Odana to the railroad tracks. And then I wanted to highlight uh, some anchors of the neighborhood that start out with the churches. Uh, I think uh, Westmoreland is pretty, pretty unique, and we actually have five churches in the area. I, didn't, I couldn't figure out how to get the fifth one on my slide, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Baptist church down by the uh, uh, Mid Mid Midvale Boulevard by the uh, bike trail. Is, would be the fifth one. Um, Queen of Peace was the, was the first one in this group in 1955. There was a major remodeling done of Queen of Peace, uh, 1996. 
connect the school and the church and add more classrooms and a, a gymnasium. And um, Mount Olive uh, is not there anymore on Mineral Point Road. They they relocated their congregation over to what was originally the Black Hawk Church on uh, um, Seago. Thank you. Um, and then it be eventually became, there was two proposals to de redevelop it into senior housing, which um, never got got going. And so um, we now have a Madison uh, precinct uh, there. Uh, Bethany Methodist, I wanted to tell a story about that property. So the, um, the, um, the Peck family, Eben and Rosalind Peck, we're living in Blue Mounds, running a tavern there in the eight. We're going back to the 1830s now, early 30s. Um, they were they were asked to come to Madison and open a uh, a boarding house tavern for men that came from Milwaukee to build the capital, the state capital, and it was down, it was on uh, the King Street area. Uh, they did that for a few years and decided it probably wasn't the best atmosphere for their family. That by that point, I think they had a, a daughter and a son. The son was the first white person to be born in Dane County in, in the mid 1830s. So they they bought 80 acres of land from James Doty, which included the the Bethany Methodist uh, campus. Uh, they built a farmhouse there and they started farming. And after two years, uh, they were told that they don't own that land <laughs> because Doty never owned that land. <laughs> Apparently. You know, he bought and sold hundreds and hundreds of acres. Once he got the legis state legislature to make Madison the capital, there was nothing here. He bought land and, you know, to make money. And so uh, they were forced to leave that property. Um, it was actually became part, of, it was actually the Larkin farm. Uh, Larkin uh, Street is right next door to the church. So, so they, moved to, they moved to Baraboo. They were the first settlers in Baraboo. Now we're into the late 1830s, early 1840s. Mr. Peck decides uh, he's going to go to California and join the California gold rush and, you know, make his fortune. So he took off and just left the family behind. Um, there's a couple story, different versions. One was that he was, he was killed on the, on the plains by Native Americans. Another one, he got to California. He, he, you know, participated in the gold rush, but he didn't, wasn't very successful. He became a, a, a honeybee. Uh, uh, farmer, and uh, and eventually died out there. He never came back to the family. Yeah. Mrs. Peck raised the family. Yes. Um, thank you for this. It's very interesting. I was just going to point out with Midvale Lutheran, mm -hmm. the current structure was built in 1958, but there was a previous chapel that right. was facing uh, Tokay. So actually, it it became present here in 1954. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm just injecting yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank you, you bringing that up. I, I wasn't going to talk a lot about Midville Lutheran because you people know more about it than I do. And I, I know you've done a couple of history, histories of the, uh, of the congregation books, which are very good. I, um, we've, we have that in our history archives, but um, yeah, that, that, um, that's a, thank you for adding that. Uh, okay. Next. And then we have the schools. Um, both Midvale School is a public school in West, and Queen of Peace is a, a Catholic school. The first school, schools built in Madison after the war. Um, so um, um, I guess I'll just leave it at that. They, they go back to the early 50s. And then as far as commercial development, there's really not a lot in Westmoreland. Um, we have, basically have two uh, uh, commercial uh, centers one is over on you know glenway and speedway and M mineral point road um there was a, a a building where the hairdresser is now that was a, what was called glenway shopping center it had uh, a liquor store um a barber shop in the basement a drug store um that's how it originally started out um and then you know kitty corner from there of course there was the village bar and there was a hardware store and uh, a grocery store along Min Mineral Point Road. But then uh, in this area, um, started out as Midvale Plaza in the late 1950s and uh, um, was redeveloped into Sequoia Commons in the late 2000s. Uh, and the library, I, I would say, is the major anchor of the, of the project, uh, very popular. 
to the point where it, it has created some parking and some traffic issues. And uh, I, I don't think they anticipated how many, what a draw it would be to the neighborhood. Okay. And then uh, village bar. I'm interested in the village bar from a, uh, the, the um, point of the building itself. Um, the building was relocated. It was a hardware store down on University Avenue, uh, right next to where the, the, the uni original university hospital was built in the late uh, or in the 1920s. And the university wanted the property where the hardware store was, they were going to build a dormitory for nurses, which they did, and it, which is not there anymore. It's been replaced by other university buildings, but right at the corner of Randall and University Avenue. So um, um, a, a fellow by the name of Hurling bought the building and moved it. And the story is the legend. I, I've been, I've never been able to find a picture of this, but supposedly they dragged the building out University Avenue, up the hill next to West High, out Speedway, but with horses. That was a that was a common way of moving structures at that time, 1920s. So they set it on a foundation here, and it started out as a hardware store uh, for a few years, uh, and then when Prohibition ended, they added a bar in the corner. And which I've been told only men could go to, uh, but the Hurlings eventually sold it to Bob Waterman, who developed, uh, expanded it into a full bar, and then uh, he sold it in the 1950s to Frank Vitale and Joe Namio. If any of you've been in Madison for a long time, there was Namio's Supper Club out on Park Street. That's Joe Namio. These guys were brother-in-laws, so. Uh, after a while, Joe left the partnership and and bought the old uh, um, supper club that was there, and he changed the name to Namios. And then, so uh, Frank Vitale continued to operate it until he sold it, and it's been resold a couple different times since. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, I wanted to mention our book projects. Um, this presentation today was pretty much based on our first book came out in 2011, Westmoreland, a great place to live. Uh, and it's, it's, it's basically a collection of all the history articles we've written up till then. Um, we hired a, an editor that put it all together to make it sound like only one person had written the whole thing. And uh, that was pretty successful. We still sell copies of that book. All of these books are available across the street at the library. The next one was uh, a few years later, we did a book that was a collection of oral history interviews, 19 longtime Westmoreland families told stories about their memories of Westmoreland. Um, and uh, there's some pretty good uh, recollections in here that uh, people growing up in Westmoreland, raising a family in Westmoreland, still living in Westmoreland. And then between the, those two books, we also did a walking tour book um, in, in partnership with a uh, art history professor at the university, we were able to get a grant for this project. Uh, she was hosting a, uh, um, a what's called vernacular architecture conference in Madison a few years ago. And Westmoreland neighborhood was one, was on their tour schedule. And then she got uh, some graduate students helped her put our tour book together. So um, these are avail also available at the, at the uh, library and also at two spots along the bike trail. And then the last pro book project um, is uh, a history of, West, of the Village Bar. And I wanted, I wanted to do this to document the, the, the uh, building itself and also the previous owner. So this is a, is a smaller book. Um, it, it's only about 45 pages, I think. But uh, we wanted to get all that documentation together. And fortunately, um, uh, a grandson of uh, Mr. Hurling that originally uh, started the place, uh, got in touch with me from the state of Washington after our first history book went, went out. And he's provided me with uh, a lot of uh, more history of the Hurling family and in the village bar and gave me some photographs of the, those old time photographs you saw of the guys at the bar. And then um, I also got in touch with a daughter of Bob Waterman and she sent me uh, a lot of pictures of uh, when her dad owned the bar. So, um, it, you know, with the internet nowadays, you can reach out to, she lives in the Phoenix area. <laughs> you reach out to people all over the place and they're very cooperative in sharing historical information with you. Okay.
So uh, we do have a website. Uh, it's part of the Westmoreland Neighborhood Association website, and there's a lot of uh, uh, transcripts of the oral history interviews we've done, a lot of photo historic photographs, um, a lot of uh, copies of newspaper articles that have been done about Westmoreland over the years. So um, that's another source of information on Westmoreland. So uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you. Just, I have one more comments. So um, that walking tour, was that written with Anna Adrzejewski? Yes. She's we had just, here. you know, we have her scheduled to talk oh, about Frank yeah. Lloyd Wright in Madison in April. Yes. So come back for that. Yeah. And we have from the church library, we have the West, you know, your Westmoreland book, if anyone wants to check it out and bring yeah, it home. I, and we also have the Midvale Heights history book. Yeah, so I, any? Yeah, I also brought copies of our book projects if you want to page through them. Um, they're, ve they're available for a very minimal cost at the library. The walking tour book is free, but the other books uh, cost $10 and the village bar one is five, I think. But all that money supports the uh, Westmoreland Neighborhood Association. Any yes. questions? Oh, come on, Nancy, you gotta have a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nancy, you have a question? <laughs> no? Yes. Uh, there's a f famous theologian that lived in Westmoreland, Matthew Fox. I think he was born, uh, his family. Uh, but he lived, I've often wondered I, if I knew his address, I would drive by there just because I, I like him a lot. And Well, that's interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that. We have a we have a collection of uh, neighborhood directories that go back to 1948. I could look his name up. Was he? Uh, his father was, I think, a coach, uh, or at least on the athletic staff at the UW. Okay. And I know Matthew Fox was born at St. Mary's Hospital, and I don't know uh, how long he stayed here. I don't think he stayed here. Uh, I mean, he's he. He's, uh, I think he's out in California now, but he's moved around a lot. Okay. He's probably about 80, 80 now. Okay. But uh, I, I, I just like to drive by his house and see where this guy lived. I will, uh, I will research that some more and see if we can get an answer. Um, I like to, um, I like to do artic history articles about people that are somehow associated with Westmoreland, and or um, structures in most cases, the houses of Westmoreland. That uh, highlighting the different sty uh, housing styles, but uh, I could look that up and see what I can find. Okay, thank you for that comment. Yeah, I, I live in Midvale Heights, but when I'm at the library, I always like to grab one of the Westmoreland newsletters just to read the articles. There's some interesting things. Anybody else? Well, thank so, you very much for your attention. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So next week at this time, we'll be in the sanctuary for our kind of congregational music program. It should be good. Yes. You do look familiar. Yeah. 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 Right. Have you seen